Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world today. Susan Pierce here with Eden's Living TV, and we have a little co-host today. Sabalu is in the house. Yes, you babe. That's Sabalu. And animals are wonderful for post-traumatic stress. She might talk to us tonight. But we have Dr. Radley in the house. He's launching it. She's like, Mom, that's a little loud. <laughs> Turn it down, lady. Um, we have Dr. Radley in the house, and he is launching his first book. So he is launching Root Causes to Healing Branches book launch with Eden's Living TV. Welcome, Dr. Radley. Hi, Susan, and it's always a pleasure to be on your program, we are and especially wonderful. even more so tonight, um, being able to launch my book. Um, the ebook has already officially launched on the 24th. So on, the on Thursday, the ebook was launched. It's on Amazon at www.traumatoptsd.com. It's the link that you could get the book. And today is the day that it officially goes on pre orders for the print copy. So thank you, Suzanne, for hosting this and allowing me this opportunity to do this launch with you. Well, I am just. Uh that you chose my platform to launch your book. And I tell you, you're one of my favorite naturopaths out there. You are a serviceman. Thank you, sir. You are Army. Saba says, I salute you. And, uh, you know, you're an expert in the field of post-traumatic stress because you yourself live this just as I do. So let's teach brother. All right. So I wanted to talk a little bit about my journey towards the publication. Um, like Suzanne said, I served in the military. I served for six years. Um, I had one deployment in Iraq and Kuwait in 2016 to 2017 in support of Operation Inherent Resolve. Um, prior to going on deployment, just being in the service, I sort of drew an interest in the topic of PTSD while being in clinic at school at University of Bridgeport, similarly working with patients who's been exposed to trauma and PTSD. I drew my interest toward that topic. And part of our requirement in order to graduate from naturopathic medical school, we have to do our thesis. And I chose the topic of understanding and treating PTSD using the six principles of naturopathic medicine. So this was my main start towards writing on this topic and really doing any type of research into this topic. Following that, I actually had a publication in the NDNR journal um, on the same topic of PTSD and the sixth principle of naturopathic medicine. Following that, um, the University of Bridgeport actually had a research day. They have an annual event every year um, about promoting research within the school itself. So my advisor for my thesis recommended, let's present the poster of the thesis and um, took her up on that. and. I went there, so the picture that you see there, it's actually me at the, that poster presentation. Um, and you look mighty handsome, may I say, sir. So thank you for your service. Thank you. And I'm even um, burning just so we won't have any disruptions, a little bit of amethyst, which is a healing frequency, as you have taught me uh, when stressed or triggered. I use a lot of smoke therapy. <clears throat> I use frequency. I use things for EMF protection. And a little shout out to EMF Solutions. If you want to protect your car, your house, yourself, before we start teaching on post-traumatic stress, a lot of people with post-traumatic stress have anxiety disorders. And if you don't address the radiation, the EMFs, guys, it's going to drive, it's going to drive the anxiety. It's going to drive that frequency. We can touch on that, let Dr. Radley teach. That. But if you don't remediate around you, that radiation is going to keep you from healing. So a little shout out to EMF Solutions. Inbox me at Eden's Living TV. And thank you for sponsoring. I'm going to totally turn this over to Dr. Radley and let him captain this show. Thank you, Suzanne. And I've had the opportunity to present a lot of times with Suzanne. Um, and I'm very grateful for that because each time I present it becomes a learning opportunity for me. Every patient that comes through my door has been a learning opportunity for me, especially dealing with the aspect of trauma and PTSD. So through doing those podcasts, webinars, it sort of inspired me to keep learning more. During the poster presentation, there was one doctor, Dr. Punk, who was one of the, 
the persons coming around and um, evaluating each person's posters and grading them. Um, and he actually recommended, he said, you have a lot of information all in one place that is not accessible to everybody. So really consider taking this opportunity and converting your thesis into a book. This happened in 2017, 2018, before I graduated. And then come 2021, I'm here saying that I'm officially publishing my very first book. So I'm very grateful for everyone who has been along this journey helping me to get here today. And I know Suzanne, you've been, played a big part, like I said. Um, we've done multiple talks and podcasts together, um, all specific to the topic of PTSD and trauma, just very in different aspects of it. So each time I presented with you, I had a learning experience for myself. So all of those things together has been an extra guide towards improving the book, putting together the book. So again, thank you very much, Suzanne. You're very welcome. You. And I honor your process. And I actually had a creative idea as you were talking about that. I think we need to put a docu-series together with each show and offer that as an opportunity to learn different aspects of post-traumatic stress and maybe with the docu series, throw the, your book in, and along with maybe some life coaching. I think that in EMF mm -hmm. products, I think that would be great. I agree. I definitely think that would be great. That would be a great opportunity to, to expand both for myself and for you. And, and get you uh, out there to let people know on a national and international. I'd like to congratulate you, actually, and a little shout out to Pantia. Uh, she's a friend of mine that is a natural fertility specialist, and she is about to, I believe, have you in her interview on her show and possibly co-author a male fertility perspective with her. So congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And you thank you for being the one to help make that connection. You're welcome. You've just stepped on a global and international level, and you are an expert in your field, sir. So hats off to you. Thank you. Let's so, talk about this beautiful book in your, your, you know, it's amazing because I am about to come out with my own book. The things that we walk through that, that we think are going to break us and that is going to defeat us. Actually, when we walk through it, we're triumph, we're champions. And now we come with our perspective to help those that are still might be on fire. We come to give them water. You have an expertise here, your process. You have honored the process of healing. You had documented and empowered yourself through healing. That's the fundamental pillars of naturopathy. And that's what makes allopathic versus naturopathy so powerful allopathic drugs treat symptoms where a naturopathic gets to the root cause you mentioned the six pillars of health and i tell that you have applied these pillars and do no harm and to empower your clients and patients and getting to the root cause addressing the emotional trauma that is in the subconscious that is locked in the electrical field and i commend you for teaching the true root cause of how to heal post-traumatic stress naturally through holistic measures, how you heal. Thank you, Suzanne. So the book basically, it's trauma is real, right? It's real as yesterday. And as much as we try to deny it, it does have an impact on our lives. Together, we're all traveling through this journey of life. Along the way, we are exposed to varying types of trauma, some that affects us more than others, and some that we may not even realize how it influences our life. So this book is not really meant to diagnose, um, but rather it's to be used to help raise awareness to the topic of trauma in each and all of our lives. And in order to deal with a problem first, we must be able to identify the problem. So again, the addressing the issue of treating the underlying cause is one of the reasons for right. getting into the book. We aren't treating, curing, diagnosing, not even preventing here. We are an educational platform only, even though Dr. Radley is a doctor. You must make an appointment, sign paperwork to get an individual consult. So this is, again, we do not treat, cure, prevent, and this is educational platform only. Um, a big part that I want to mention here as well is that there's a lot of times that we look at just the diagnosis. We wait till you get formally diagnosed with PTSD to, to try to get help. And it's an unfortunate situation that 
what that does, it puts us pretty much into a box, right? Um, you have to fit certain criteria in order to be able to be diagnosed with PTSD. However, that leaves room for saying that what about all other traumas that you've been through? Are they not, do they not have any value or, or effects on your life? And this is one of the reasons for the book. It's to bring awareness to that idea of that. Because too often you see people waiting and waiting and they, they go through trauma. Sometimes they know, sometimes they don't realize it. And they have a lot of health impacts that comes as a result of being exposed to trauma. And let me, let me as, interrupt you here because we talked before we went on and I told you, you know, I was messed with as a little girl. I never knew honestly that I probably had been in fight or flight and had been post-traumatically stressed since I was a child. And that's why my attention is all over the place. My brain is imbalanced. I have autoimmune issues and chronic pain and even asthma, respiratory issues. Studies have shown if you had abuse as a child, your respiratory doesn't develop all the way. And then if you've had trauma, and I'm gonna let you talk about this, how the prefrontal cortex gets really stunted and you either become stuck at that age in trauma, post traumatically stressed, or you become a little healing empath like you and myself. I'll let you address that. But yeah, I didn't even know, I just told you, I didn't even know that I had post-traumatic stress complex. I had no idea that I'd even faced trauma, even though I was in a car wreck, bed bound, my mother died in my arms and I was abused and all the kind of crap that happened. No idea whatsoever. So it does, like you mentioned, trauma does play an impact on brain development. And the last podcast we did actually was on the topic of childhood trauma and the long-term effects of those traumas. And we talked about how, as you go along, every age, as you grow older, there's different developmental um, phases that you go through. And during each phase, you start to learn about certain things like socialization. How would you interact with other people? You start building your own personal traits and your characteristics. Whenever there's some type of trauma, like Suzanne said, what happens is the, the brain itself becomes delayed. The growth at that point sort of becomes stunted and more and more trauma that you're exposed to, it's more and more damage it creates. So it slows down everything on a wide spectrum. What that does in the long run is it keeps you stuck in that fight or flight. In my book, I actually talked about something um, relating to that where trauma builds on each other. And as you go through life, it becomes sort of like an onion. So whenever you start peeling off trauma, sometimes you peel off trauma and you keep peeling off, peeling off, peeling off, and you get to figure out that deep down there's what I call sort of like a, a trauma magnet. And it's basically the first trauma that happened to you. And you get stuck with so much different things happening to you and the way that you develop, the way that you respond to people, the way that you interact with people, the way that you form relationships with people and even with yourself, it's all affected because of this one trauma magnet. And as you grow older and more trauma happens, it sort of creates a barrier over that one. It becomes pretty much somewhere hidden in the back of your mind till it becomes more or less subconscious and, and your electrical field people don't realize what i did an aos scan and an evoc scan that reads your subconscious and then addresses the emotional traumas that are linked that's manifesting where the energy blocks it, it's reading your bioresonance is what it's doing mm -hmm. and when i realized that i was in so much trauma that it literally made my energy portal spin backwards and I was being sucked dry by energy vampires because I didn't have boundaries because I was traumatized and didn't know how to socialize. And then when I was traumatized, assaulted, I isolated. And then I didn't trust anybody. And then I didn't have relationships because again, I didn't trust anybody, but it was because I was traumatized. And I was in post traumatic stress, which I had no idea. It's a cycle. It, it definitely is a cycle. And that's what happens. You get stuck into that cycle you get stuck so much into that cycle that you don't even realize that is what is going on. And then it's and the not until somebody else points it out. You have the ruminating thoughts, the racing mind, the ruminating of the experience. I think you had, didn't you have a, a fellow soldier die? Was that you? Am I getting you mixed up with another friend of mine? Um, I have had 
one of the guys that I got deployed with actually died, but he died. Yeah, I remember that. Back you home. you were real upset about cancer. that, weren't you? Yeah. So it was tough dealing with that, like coming back home. And then he ended up dying of cancer. He got cancer on deployment and then he ended up dying afterwards. So it was tough dealing with that. Um, when we were on deployment as well, um, there was a lieutenant from another unit who were all together on the same base that ended up dying in a, um, yeah, trauma. on a mine and he was blown up there. So being in and weren't around you injured? Weren't you injured? I wasn't injured, no. Okay, I thought you were injured. Yeah. But there were, thankfully, no one from my unit were, but we were around other units on the bases um, that have had injuries and have had even to the point where there was that, like I said, with that lieutenant. So just being there and being exposed to those things and knowing the risk that you're constantly exposed to in itself becomes traumatic. And trauma, as we talked about, Oh, I'm getting a little feedback. Is that okay? Are you hearing? That's why I'm having an echo. Are you okay on that end? I'm okay on this end, yeah. Okay, let's do that again, guys. Back off my in Jesus' name, back off. Uh, establish this airlines, airlines, airways. I love, matter of fact, real quick, I love your graphics, your marketing piece there with it coming down in the branches of healing. I love the blue, I love the black. It pops, Radley. It pops. I love it. It's a great marketing. You. You have, did you do that? Or did you hire somebody? I did this um, this specific graphic in here. Uh, some of the graphics that would be used in this, I have had other people help me out doing that. So well, my publisher has helped tell me. Tell them they did a fabulous job because I'm a marketing person. I am media. And I was like, dang, that looks good. And as we're interviewing that coming down, that's beautiful. So yeah. as we said, sometimes we don't even know we're traumatized <clears throat> and we carry that in our electrical field. The Evox that I did was amazing, Radley. You put um, your hand in a Zydo cradle to get your bioresonance. And then you read, they do your voice imprint. And then the computer, you put on LED, you know, the glasses with the LED and the headphones. And you got a full symphony orchestra totally resetting those neural pathways and balancing as the computer is reading what part of the brain is holding trauma and then it processes i processed my mother dying in my arms saying my name her last words were so she was having a stroke she couldn't say my name i couldn't even tell that story for 30 years though you know i couldn't talk in two minutes I processed that trauma and it read, I have a whole readout. It was saying anger, feeling unloved, unworthy. Cause I, you know, I don't trust people isolated. My family walked away. And the mm -hmm. fact that you can do bioresonance feeding, read it and then address with frequency and give you nutrition. This is what I want you to meet Dr. Mary. If you're, I know Dr. Mary, I'm going to send this to her. A little shout out to a couple of people, Dr. Mary, NC, she is UCLA, she teaches brain balancing. So I want to hook you up because trauma is all about the brain being unbalanced. So let's teach, brother. Yep. So like you said, there is that experience when trauma happens, it does affect the brain and it creates that imbalance. And there's a big part of the healing process is now readapting to this new balance. We get so caught up into our everyday lives, we don't realize that we're in, in that cycle. We don't realize we're stuck with trauma and we keep going, going, going. When you're stuck in fight or flight, you don't always realize it. It has to take somebody or you becoming self-aware enough to identify that, hey, something's wrong. And a lot of times it takes a little bit digging and it's an uncomfortable situation to be in when that happens because you get so used to living your day living your life day to day that you don't realize that you're on repeat cycle you don't realize that you're on autopilot and then when somebody comes and say stop this is what is going on it puts you into an uncomfortable position because you keep going on and saying well everything feels okay or it feels good but you don't realize that you're not really feeling good until you actually heal so 
this is one of my goals with this book is to bring some more of that clarity to some of the roots of trauma, to provide a chance for individuals to use their trauma to help them grow rather than to restrict themselves. And it also to give people a better understanding of aspects of their lives that they may not even be realizing that has been affected by trauma. And as a result, once you could identify the trauma, once you could identify the root cause, you could start creating that healing space. You could start moving forward. You could start experiencing empowerment and you could start moving into post-trauma growth. So rather than being stuck in post-traumatic stress disorder, you have an opportunity to become one of those people that experience post-trauma growth. And I like using this expression of diamonds don't, they have to go through that rough period. They have to go through that process and to become what they are. So that it's extreme the pressure. It's the extreme pressure or trauma that literally molds you like a diamond. So you have to allow that. Accept, rather, it should be refining you so you could become more of like a diamond. That's, that's my main point there. You have to be cut and chiseled, brother. It literally is. Let me move us out of the way here so they can see on Instagram. And welcome, my Instagram followers. Thank you for tuning in tonight. This is Dr. Radley, and he is a naturopath specialist, and we're going to get into some of his presentation now. Let me adjust this for my audience here, please. And they will be able to see us. All right. Thank you for tuning in, Instagram audience. Go ahead, Dr. Radley. So with my book, um, some of the tough topics that I cover, I go into uh, some of the risk factors that are associated with PTSD. It doesn't just talk about um, one aspect of risk factors. It goes into sort of like a, a, a broad-based um, coverage of fa risk factors. So it covers things like anatomical defects, um, anatomical anomalies that happen as a result of trauma or whatever it is, um, being risk factors, things like neurochemicals, um, things like how does your diet play a risk in, in you developing PTSD when your body lacks certain nutrients that are important for proper brain functions, they could all increase the risk of one developing PTSD. Even something that is often overlooked, one risk factor of developing PTSD is the amount of exposure to trauma. So too often, we don't realize the different types of trauma that happens in our life. And as a result, we ignore it. So we ignore that as being a risk factor. So the goal with this book is once I could bring that awareness to all these different scopes or risk factors, if you could address them, it reduces your risk of being somebody that who could go into developing PTSD. So if you could heal before developing PTSD, then it makes your life a lot better as an individual. Um, I also talk about different types of trauma. So things like acute trauma, um, chronic trauma, uh, complex PTSD, and again, the different types of trauma, things like abuse, um, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse, whatever it is. Um, those are different types of traumas that I cover. I also talked about things like transgenerational trauma, which was another podcast presentation that I did with Suzanne in the past. Um, things like social injustice, racism, inequality, cultural norms. How does these things become a trauma for an individual? And how with these things that actually increases the risk of somebody developing PTSD later on. Then I also talk about something called comfort and trauma. So this is basically when you get sort of stuck in that cycle like we were talking about earlier, you don't realize what is going on. You feel comfortable being in, in your traumatic situation. A good example um, is sometimes you meet soldiers who come back from deployment and they tell you like, I have this desire to go back onto deployment. I wanna go back into a war zone. And the average ordinary person would look at them and it's like, why? It doesn't make sense. Why do you wanna go back? And they don't know how to answer it. Usually they say, I just feel like I need to be there. And they give you every possible reason. But what actually happens is that when you're constantly exposed to trauma, you develop a protective mechanism. It is designed to survive, right? 
So we go into survival mode, we get stuck in fight or flight and we develop a comfort within that trauma itself. So when we come out of that, we feel like we're missing something. You also see it with people who go from abusive relationships to abusive relationships. They start off, they live or grew up in an abusive home and then they start seeking out abusive relationships. They get out of one and they jump right into another one. And it's not that they necessarily look for it, but that's exactly what is happening. It's they look for it without knowing that that's what they're doing. And you know what I've learned, like you said, the onion, when you peel it, that magnet of trauma, you're literally like, I, I, I won't say who, because I'm working with this person, but they went through a nasty divorce that the spouse was the energy vampire. This person went into a mo he actually, I think it's still stuck in fight or flight. Cause he's like, Whoa, what happened to me? Like you're bamboozled. So you can't think a lot of comfort eating and then winds up at 360 something and it's emotional. It, and you know what the AOS scan showed? Grief and trauma. Grief. Stuck in grief. It affects the body. Doesn't even realize it's post-traumatic stress. No clue. But from an outside looking in, I see it. It's so clear to me. And the do you ever have clients? I have other clients that do like a lot of drinking or drugs or risky behavior because of the trauma. Can you talk about that a little bit? And I noticed boundaries. I want to invite you back to do a boundaries video. I'd actually like to do all these and do videos and put a docu series together. We're going to do that. But I really want to talk about boundaries. But let's talk about the riskiness of you know some of the that happens like the affairs that might happen or the, the drug abuse that they're trying to self-medicate i mean let's talk about that so basically what happens is that it becomes a distraction like when they're exposed to that trauma and they don't have an avenue necessarily to get it out they need to find some type of avenue as a distraction so you choose to do these things you choose to go into drinking and then drinking gives you a false sense of hope. It gives you a distraction. It takes your mind away from the trauma. Right. But the question is, well, how long does it really do that? Um, even in cases where people cheat, it's the same thing. It's, I'm looking for a distraction um, from be it my husband or, or my wife, as the case might be. And they switch into cheating on their partner because of that reason they associate some type of trauma with one person. So they use a distraction on another side. Um, and also, I mean, also to feed the, you know, if you're a sex addict, some that I've worked with people that were having affairs left and right, spreading herpes. And I was like, you're a sex addict. Your brain needs that, you know, mm -hmm. sex and drugs light up the same parts of the brain. Let's, let's touch on that too. And then the healthy boundaries of learning these people that they're toxic. They're toxic okay. until they're healed. Yep. So like you said, sex on drugs has that high that you get from it. It's an adrenaline rush that you end up getting from it. So that helps to create sort of that same response that when you're in fight or flight, where you have that heightened emotion. So you get comfort in those things and you keep seeking it out. And again, it's a matter of using it as a distraction mm -hmm. rather than actually taking the opportunity and saying, hey, this is what is going on. I'm actually being affected by my trauma and you need to find ways to sort of deal with it and that's what is important it's dealing with it in healthy ways and not going and taking xanax and ambien and alcohol or watching your porn or going your shopping or going and having your affairs all the unhealthy you know coping mechanisms devices or vices that addicts use in trauma you know, your brain's inflamed, you can't think, you're in fight or flight, your blood's in your extremities, not in your organs, your body starts breaking down from high cortisol, you can't eat or sleep, sound familiar guys, your anxiety's through the roof, anxiety goes up, D digestion goes down, you start having colon problems, you start having liver problems because you're holding anger or shame <clears throat> or guilt for God's sakes. Exactly, so there's a lot of range a wide range of things that could stem from just holding on to trauma. I've seen patients who is coming with simple things like abdominal pain. That's their main complaint. Knee pain, back pain, um, digestive knee issues. Pain. Knee 
everything because the knees are literally the structure pillars of your mm -hmm. everything. And if you're going yep. through trauma, your whole structure is going to be attacked. I have a client right now. It's a knee, but it's emotional. It's emotional. Yep. And that's what happens. You don't realize that it's emotional. And sometimes when you try digging into that emotional part and make that connection to some type of trauma, they don't, patients don't always realize it. So sometimes it's difficult for people to admit to it. And again, this is one of my goals for the book. If I could bring more awareness to how common traumas are, then by chance it would allow people to be, well, I understand this could actually be an effect for me long-term. So people would pay more attention. People would make things like trauma and PTSD and mental health a more common topic that they could talk about. And I think it's wonderful. I mean, I'm just looking at your chapters i believe here you've got the risk factors you've got the types of trauma trauma you've got transgenerational trauma that passing it along generational curses your social injustice your racism your inequality your cultural norms as trauma then we get that comfort in trauma we talk about triggers let's talk about triggers so triggers are basically anything that happens around you that could put you back into that original state of the trauma that happens. So triggers could be simple things from sounds to smells to anything that could interact with any emotion and mm -hmm. any of all five senses. So when I have people work on identifying their triggers, what I have them do is sort of correlate their original event to whatever is their most recent event that they have that connection of trauma to and make note of everything that coincides with both. So what do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you feel? What do you taste? What could you touch? Everything. What types of emotions was um, stimulated? And once you start making that connections, you will start identifying the triggers. Once you identify the triggers, then you could start working on allowing yourself to process it, allowing yourself to identify that the trigger is no longer a trigger that you have control and you could switch that on and off button for going into fight or flight and coming out of fight or flight. The goal is never to stop you from going into fight or flight because it's our survival mechanism, but also you don't want to go into it and be stuck in it. So once you're able to identify your triggers, then you would know that the trigger happens I'm in fight or flight. It's easier for you to recognize that I just went in fight or flight. From that point, you could establish your safety and say, I'm no longer in that abusive relationship. I'm no longer in the middle of a war zone. I'm no longer in the car accident. I'm no longer in that um, job where there was inequality and the stress from my supervisor or boss. Whatever it is, whatever the stress is, you could identify and tell yourself now that I'm safe. And that's why it's important to identify the triggers because once you could identify it, some you could avoid and some you may not be able to avoid, but the ones at least that you can't avoid, at least you will be able to make that connection that I just triggered myself and I went into fight or flight. Next step, identify that safety and allow yourself to feel and be more oriented into that present moment rather than being stuck back into whatever that original trauma was. When you reintegrate, when you've been when you've been triggered, you learn, you kind of step aside and you're like, oh gosh, I'm kind of over here in fight or flight. I need to, what is the NDNR? What is that? The, the eye movements? Dr. Mary said. EMDR. What yes, is it? Eye movement desensitization. EMDR. Eye, eye movement, movement desensitization yeah. and reprocessing. Yeah, desensitizing, reprocessing. She said, you've got to be doing that. If you have complex post-traumatic stress, she said, you've got to balance the brain. What are some other ways that you, I, I know, but what are some other ways you can balance the brain and the body? Because, you know, I did like cross-crawl something I did. It's one of the things. I did several things and I'm still doing several things just to get that right hemisphere and that left hemisphere communicating and calm mm -hmm. again. So, a simple start, it's deep breathing exercises, alternate nostril breathing, um, tapping on opposite sides. So taking the right hand, tapping on the left, 
and taking the left hand and then tapping on the right and alternating. So it allows you to sort of bring that awareness back to you. Um, even the technique of emotional freedom technique or tapping, it's a way to help bring that awareness back to you. There's certain acupressure points, acupuncture points that you can use to help center and ground yourself back into place. Um, if you have right. certain, yeah, in writing as an example, um, any type of writing, and this is something that I actually included in my book, um, writing as a form of therapy. And the way that I approach it is that the writing should be yours and it shouldn't necessarily be structured. I have personally used writing as a form of um, relaxing, centering myself, grounding myself, um, decompressing, de-stressing, yes. whatever you want to call it. I've used it as my name. Dr. Bradley, because my brain, it won't turn off because, you know, I, I have a production company, I have a TV show, I do radio, I professionally write, I'm a medical freedom activist. I'm like, oh my God, what hat am I wearing today? And I'm exhausted. So I have to be very focused and it's so hard because I'm all over the place. And when I get home at night, I have learned to journal and kind of let the brain kind of vomit the day and it can... I think they call it like, what is it? Compartmentalization that when you write, it releases. The right is the creative side where the trauma is. The left is the numbers, accountants, numbers, logical, very logical. This is creative. Woo, let's get crazy and let our hair down. This guy's like, no, man, I want facts. I want scientific data. And some people that get stuck up in the left hemisphere, they're stuck. People over here are creative. They can't think analytically. And their brain literally is off balance. And that's the ruminating, the racing thoughts. So when I write at night, I'm not only kind of looking at my day going, man, I need to really work on that. It's something that just happened that's crazy. But it's kind of like I release it from my brain. And then my, the it's just, I don't know, it's pen to paper is what my doctor said. It's neurological pathways, intention, movement, like the cross crawl, I never crawled as a child. He said, Susan, your, your brain never developed. That part of your brain never developed. I said, I'm 53 years old. He went, you got to crawl. I get down the floor and crawl like a baby now to try to get my brain. That neural pathway was never yeah. set. And that's the thing is you have an opportunity, like you said, even if you're an adult, no, whatever happened and you missed out as a kid, there's no reason why you can't do some of those things to help develop those pathways or to help um, activate some of those pathways. So again, the idea is always to find something that works best for the individual. Um, like I said, I like writing. Um, there are people who are very easy to talk. Um, they would come in and they would just spill every single bean about every trauma that happened. You just have to ask yeah. the question of like, all right, what has happened? Were you exposed to something traumatic? And they openly, willingly spill the beans on everything. And then their other patients are like very hesitant to talk about yeah. it. Um, yep. So some people need to find what works best for them. So there are creative types of therapies. So things like art, um, writing, coloring, music, singing, music, music light, exercise. Light. Color, I, I do have. the magenta glasses, or, or do you wear the glass? These are blue blockers, by the way. Everybody that's in front of podcasting and out there, you really, it's so important to protect yourself from the blue light. This blue light affects and can drive anxiety, just like the EMFs. If you don't correct stuff and you have anxiety problems, don't come to me because I've told you. <laughs> or do come to me and I'll help you with it. So, or Dr. Radley. So, like you said, even that becomes one risk factor. And that's the thing. It's like you want to control those things when you could identify them. So identifying things like EMF, radiation, being potential risk factors for you of increasing inflammation in the brain. There you go. If that's one thing you could reduce, then definitely that's one step closer to preventing you from developing PTSD. And your so thyroid. All this EMF and, you know, toxic living that we do, if our thyroids and adrenals and you have, I promise you, if you have post-traumatic stress, and I guarantee you, Dr. Rather would go, absolutely. You probably have adrenal stress, probably have digestion problems, and you probably have achy joints and a racing heart and sleep issues. 
So and the next thing in the book is boundaries. So boundaries are basically a protective mechanism that you could set um, based on um, the idea of boundaries is like I said, it's a protective mechanism. So I like using the analogy of taking off you sitting and building a house or building the walls of the house. And the type of boundaries that you want is one that would be best for you, right? So there are different types of boundaries. There is very strict and, and hardened boundaries that you don't want to have. So that would pretty much be you building a house and you're inside, you put four solid walls on a sealed roof, sealed floor, and there's no way out. There's nothing that could come in or there's nothing that could go up. So that would be something that you definitely don't want. Then there's the option of porous border, um, porous boundaries. So that would be like, say, let me build half of the roof and put two walls up. Whenever you're exposed to some type of um, major natural disasters, you don't have protections as much as you need to. So again, the type of porous boundaries is not what you want. Then there's the type that is non-existent where you don't put any walls up, you don't put any roof up. You're just there sitting with the floor and you live in out in the open, right? So that is uh, a non-existent boundary. And then there's the option of a healthy boundary, which would basically be something that would look like, I have my house, I have a roof, I have four walls, but I have doors and windows that I could control that would allow people in, people out. And in that way, now I actually have control of myself. I could separate my space from your space. And that's what makes it a healthy boundary versus an unhealthy boundary. So yeah, it's I've important. Learned to cut, to, I've learned to cut toxic people. If you name call or attack me or disrespect my time or you know not show up for cop podcasts, I, I just like, I'm, I don't have time for you. Like I really, or narcissism, I don't have time for that. And that's what you have to do. You have to set your own boundaries and everybody boundaries has to be different. They don't have to necessarily be the same exact thing. So Suzanne, you might set one boundary that is applicable to your life. And then my version of the same style of boundary may be a little bit different because it's my protective mechanism. It might be stemming from whatever my trauma was. And that's the goal. It's your boundaries has to be linked to whatever your trauma is and whatever you feel like you're losing control of. So the boundaries as a means to help you regain control of your life. It's all about being in control. Yep, and exactly that. You switch from fight or flight. When you're in fight or flight, you don't have control. When you switch out of fight or flight, you have the opportunity to be in control. And with that being said, I'm going to move on to the ne next topic of the relationship to trauma. Um, like I mentioned before, a lot of people wait until they're diagnosed with PTSD to understand that trauma has affected their lives. Some people become their diagnosis of PTSD and they get sealed off into this um, box where they feel like they don't have any hope. So they go in for one type of therapy and it didn't work for them. And they're like, well, I guess I'm stuck. I'm, I have PTSD, there's no hope for me. And they develop that relationship with PTSD and trauma. And they don't feel like there's an opportunity to separate them. And this section sort of helps you understand that the way that you look at trauma, the way that you think about PTSD makes a difference for you and for the others around you. It helps you to make better connections once you could establish how you as an individual relates to your trauma, to your PTSD, how other people relate to their trauma and how they relate to their PTSD. Once they could identify how they relate, then you could build better um, relationship between you and yourself and you and other people. And you know, <laughs> after you've isolated and I have, I really used to be scared of people, but I also realized during COVID how important community support was and just community. Yep. And community support is a big part of healing and the people that you have around you is important. Going back to boundaries, boundaries is one way of limiting who you have around you and who you don't have around you. Yeah. Um, and 
stepping into the next topic of finding the right approach to healing, there are tons of different scientific studies all around the world that tells you that different types of modalities work for PTSD, right? Yes. So that is what I found out when I did my thesis. I found that there's so much research out there that tells you, yes, X, Y, and Z works, things like EMDR, EFT, um, tapping, horticulture, um, animal therapy, talk therapy, variant styles of talk therapy, expressive therapy. These things all have a place in the healing process of PTSD. And the section of finding the right approach to healing is basically telling you that there are options. Don't give up hope because you tried one type of therapy and it didn't work for you. A lot of people do that. A lot of people go in for therapy and the only type of therapy they seek is talk therapy. They're typically one who don't feel like they are always open to talking. So they don't express what they need to express. They come back out of talk therapy and feel like they don't have or they didn't get enough time to express what whatever has been going on. And I can tell you from personal experience that has happened to me. When I came back from deployment, I had a lot of issues readjusting. I came straight back from deployment and went right back into finishing my final year of medical school. So that in itself was a huge stress, a huge trauma on me trying to readapt. And I jumped back into the semester right around midterm exams. So you could imagine now me having to catch back up a half a semester of things from a year ago. And this is what has happened to me when I came back. I started dropping in grades. I started having problems with sleep. I started having my wide range of PTSD symptoms. And what were your I, symptoms if I can ask? What were your symptoms? One of the major things was really not sleeping. I would go two or three days without actually falling asleep. When we were on deployment, sometimes you would have days like that where you would be waking up from sleep and you wouldn't necessarily be able to fall back asleep. Sometimes you wake up from sleep and then you only have like an hour window before you have to actually get up to go out or do whatever the mission is. And I guess I trained myself there that don't fall back asleep for that one hour. And it became such a repetitive thing that when I came home, if I missed a window of sleep, I would not be able to fall asleep. And I was actually able to function physically the next day. I could go to school. I could look like I'm taking notes in class. I could go to my clinic, attend to patients, and nobody would know that I didn't sleep. Go home, same thing happens the next day, not able to fall asleep come back out the next day and the same thing happens. And I just repeat that cycle and nobody knows what is going on because everything's on a mental level more so than a physical level. And that was one of my biggest thing. And then when it was time to study, I would study, I would read everything and I would feel very comfortable with it. I would close the book, walk away and then come back and say, let me repeat this. And I would look at it and I would literally be like, I don't remember seeing any of this. So those were like my symptoms. Um, that, that, that nervous I inflammation. I literally used to walk around. I called my doctor, who's, in, who's a chiropractor, actually, very good friend of mine, Jim Bob Hagerton. A little shout out to him. And I said, Jim Bob, my brain feels like it's on fire. I used to walk around the house holding my brain. He said, because it is. It's neuro inflammation. The lining of your brain is inflamed. You're not sleeping because your cortisol is too high. You're not eating. I forgot to eat. I got anorexic. I had no desire to eat. I had no hunger, none. And I wasn't sleeping for weeks at a time. So, you know, when you go three days without sleep, you're clinically kind of, woo you know, it makes you a little crazy. Yeah, exactly. Sleep, and you sleep don't deprivation is real with post-traumatic stress and people do not understand that. Yep. And you pick up those bad habits. You go into to finding things because when you start losing sleep, now you need an adrenaline rush. So you pick up negative habits that would give you an adrenaline rush. Right. And that's where you do risky behaviors because that is the next best thing in your mind that would keep you at that adrenaline rush, keep you going yep. because three or four days without sleep. The sex, really the drinking, the drugs, the shopping, the gambling, the porn, whatever your little outlet is, if it's 
taking energy away from your body or you're poisoning your body, your mind with porn or alcohol, the sugar, it's, it's going to feed. You think you're helping your anxiety when in essence you're feeding sugar, which inflames the body and drives cognitive fog. So you have to be careful about the habits or the coping. Let's talk about learning a little bit of coping mechanisms, healthy, holistic alternatives instead of just numbing with Xanax, if you don't mind, because that's what they did to me. They numbed me with mood altering drugs. I was in a five car pileup, crippled, three and a half years physical therapy, all these traumas, 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 traumas. I went the allopathic way and lost two decades of my life. Please, guys, if you're listening to me, there are other ways. Make an appointment with Dr. Radley. Tell them what are the other ways. So some of the things that I've used with patients, uh, things like writing therapy, um, art therapy, coloring, painting. Um, I do forgiveness exercises. So some of those things are all in like my worksheets. Um, I what also do- What does the forgiveness exercise look like? So basically it's, um, you have the person identify whatever the trauma is, the person's involved in those trauma. And then you develop your, your affirmations, your forgiveness affirmations, more or less. And you practice those affirmations and you allow yourself to release the energies associated with those traumas. So you, you want to do three things, basically. You want to forgive yourself. You want to forgive that person. And you want to allow yourself to let go of whatever negative energy. So you're forgiving yourself as the person that I that has that you were when the incident happened. So it's kind of like connecting to that inner child or the inner younger version of you and telling them that it's okay. Like we could actually let go of whatever is going on. And that was identified safe. I think it's very yep. important to tell yourself that that was a trauma that happened to you. You know, I use ITR therapy where you literally draw the trauma, put the word association, tell a story you have to go back and address the little girl or little boy or the person or the young adult or the teenager. I had a client even tell me about an incident where they had a, a, a bladder embarrassment in school and, and it's, it's trauma. They still remember it. And it it's a recall. I'm like, you've never processed that. You've never addressed that. Yeah. And the more that you could identify the traumas that happened in your life, the more likely that you could work on them. and every type of trauma may not necessarily need the same exact, exact type of treatment. So some types of trauma, you may be able to talk about it. Some types of trauma, you may not feel comfortable talking about it, so you would choose writing. Sometimes you would choose things like art therapy, so you could do color and painting. And in my book, I actually, um, what I did is I have the, the cover in a color and version, right? So when I was choosing the cover for the book, um, my publisher actually advised, like, get some feedback on different takes. And I noticed that there were different covers. People were drawn to different covers. For different I told readers. you, you picked the one I picked. I said, I love the blue and I love the graphics. And I just love the, it was a clean, crisp. You saw the grass said that one. Yep. And you got a lot so, of input. I noticed people were telling you, no, man, you need to go that way. Yep. I actually ended up having a close tie between two versions of all five that were sent out. Um, the blue version that you see here. And then there were actually some people that were actually drawn to the black background. Um, so I actually chose that with the ebook, I went with the white background and the blue. And then for the print copy, you have the options of actually choosing either one, whichever one you're drawn closer towards the white background with the blue or the black background um, with the green leaves. So there are options for when you're ready to buy the book. And even with the pre-orders, you could actually go on and select which one you would prefer as an individual. And when they, come out, when they come out in hard copy, I want you to do something for me. I want a signed mm -hmm. copy. I could get that for you. Sounds good. I have a library of everybody I've ever interviewed, and I would love to put you among my ex experts around the world. Thank you. So I could definitely work on that and get enough for you. Sounds good. 
This content is amazing. It really is. And it's all easy to follow. It's not, you know, some people like I can't follow these doctors. I don't know what they're talking about. It's very, very friendly. Let me try to zoom this back out here for my Instagram audience. Again, this is Dr. Radley. He is a natural path and he has just launched his first book. And let's go ahead and talk about this Headstrong. So Headstrong is an, uh, a veteran founded uh, organization. It was founded in 2012, started in New York City. Um, and what they do is basically they provide treatment for individuals, um, treatment individually tailored and not time limited to ensure that no minds is left behind. So Headstrong's mission basically is to heal the hidden wounds of war by providing cost-free, barrier-free, stigma-free mental health treatment. And they provide these to military veterans and their family members. All of this being done at no cost to the veterans or their family. So because of this, I decided that every book that I sell, ebook or print copy through pre-orders or when the book is actually released and, print, and, and ordered, 10% of my sales will be going to this organization. So 10% of my sales will be donated to the Headstrong project. That's I contacted wonderful. them already and I made sure that we're already set in motion that this is going to happen. Um, one of my friends shared, shared this, um, a, a post from them on Instagram recently and it caught my attention and I went in and I did a little bit more research and this is how I found out about them. So I do feel like this is definitely a cause, worthwhile cause that, um, I need to support. And like I said, as I've been in the military, I am a veteran. I have served in a combat zone. Um, I've had my own fair share of dealing with PTSD and trauma. And I feel it's only fair that I could give back to the community and those that, especially this community of veterans where, and more specific to this organization because they're doing such a huge huge help to that veteran community that needs that help. And it's all being done free to the veteran and their family. So this is why I was so much drawn towards this organization. I would love if you would get me in contact with whoever founded this organization. I would like to give them a platform on Eden's Living, give them a shout out. Maybe we can get some funds coming in for them as well. Maybe even a co corporate sponsor. Okay. I'd love so to I do that. I would like to partner you. with you. And support I will this send you next your contact call. information as well for now. Yes. And do you have you have any of the contact information for Headstrong that we can just give people information now? So I believe their website is getheadstrong.org. Um, but once you Google it, Google the Headstrong project and it would come up um, and you would see, it. like I said, off the top of my head, I don't recall exactly the website. But there is a link on there, once you go in, um, that allows you to, to donate, allows you to connect with and volunteer whatever services you could to actually help this foundation to keep going. And like I said, I love what they stand for. And I love that they provide in it all up free to, to veterans. It's not, I mean, there are options that are free to veterans. There, are, yes, there's the, the veteran um, hospitals, there are free clinics around, but even within those, sometimes it's not always accessible to veterans. Uh, sometimes veterans have to go out of their way to get to some of those free places. And th this being an opportunity for veterans to connect gives even more accessibility to veterans. Hence my big, big draw towards the bottom. I love it. I love it. And I tell you, I like it because I'm sorry, I was having a little lag. I didn't mean to step on you there. I was having a little lag here in Echo. Um, the fact that I know the veteran associate, the VA has hospitals and mental health, but as you and I both know, post-traumatic stress is a very niche. It is a very small window that very few therapists actually, because post-traumatic stress looks like mental illness. Mm -hmm. And you get misdiagnosed a lot of times when it's just truly unprocessed traumas and it's post-traumatic stress. So again, like I said, buy the book, 
10% of the sales will be donated towards the Headstrong project. That's so one. So you, you have the options of either the ebook um, or the print copies. Right now, the print copies are only available for free orders up until the middle of July when they would start to be shipped out. Um, but you could actually go on to www.trauma2ptsd.com and it would give you the link to pre-order the book as well as if you want or you're interested in getting the ebook, it also gives you the link there to get it as well. All right. Well, I just want to thank you and thank you for choosing my platform to come and launch your ebook. And we are just happy to have you here. Go ahead and we're talking about a Forgive Freedom Challenge, but tell people where to get a hold of you. I'm scared we're about to cut off Radley, so I'm going to put a fire up underneath you. Okay. So the Forgive to Freedom Challenge, it's a, this is going to be a seven-day event that I'm giving free to everyone who purchases the book before 4th of July, be it the ebook or the print copy. So in terms of the print copy, it would be pre-orders. If you purchase it, send your email to universaltreehc at gmail.com. So email me the receipt of the book, and I will put your email on the subscription list to receive the email for that seven days challenge. So basically, like I mentioned, every trauma that happens, there's some type of negative energy associated with it. Once we could start forgiving those things, we could actually start letting go of those trauma. So again, seven days challenge, free to everyone who purchases the book before the 4th of July. And you ask for it, Suzanne, uh, my Facebook, I mean, my contact information. I use Facebook and Instagram. My pages on both, both are called Universal Tree Health Clinic. And my email is universaltreehc at gmail.com. So these are three means to contact me. Facebook or Instagram, you could follow me, um, DM me on there. I do check my messages more on Instagram than Facebook. But I do check it eventually. And the reason for that is I don't always get the notification on Facebook when I get a message. Um, but I could guarantee you within a one week period, I could get back to you for Facebook. On Instagram, it's usually within 24 hours I get back to you. Same thing with email. I check my email very regularly. So reach out to me at universaltreehc at gmail.com. I just started my YouTube channel, Dr. Radley Ramdan. On there, my first playlist that I made, it's actually all the podcasts that I did with Suzanne and Eden's Living TV. So I'm very grateful that, for that opportunity to work with Suzanne and have that multitude of presentations talking about varying aspects of trauma and PTSD. And I talked about things like digestive health as well as made connections to acupuncture. So all those things are things that I've done with Suzanne and I'm forever grateful to Suzanne for providing this opportunity, providing this platform to share knowledge. And knowledge is one of the only way that we can help people. So again, my website for the book is www.traumatoptsd.com. Visit it and you'll get the link to the ebook or to pre-order the hard copy of the book. So once again, thank you very much, Suzanne, for allowing me to be on your platform today to officially launch my book. And congratulations on your first book launch and your first co-author coming up with Pantia. And we're going to have you back when y'all co-author. And also, I think as a brand new author, I'd like to offer you maybe a coffee or noontime spot for anyone that buys your book and does the challenge. Maybe we can do a little breakfast chat or a little fireside chat and talk about that chapter of the book. And if they have questions, they'll be able to introduce themselves to the author and you'll be able to maybe have a 30 second, I'm not 30 second, but 30 minute little meet the author, let's greet and then read the chapter together. And if you have questions, they can interact with you. I'd love to offer that to you. Definitely, I'm definitely supportive of that. All right, thank you Any so much, Dr. Radley. Sorry? You froze, sorry. What are you saying? Oh, I was saying I would be grateful for any reviews that you get. So if you do buy the ebook, the ebook is on Amazon. So you could leave a review on there. I don't want you to leave a review until you read the book. Um, 
So read the book and then go back on and give me that review because I want to know how I was able to impact your book. Yes. Again, I showed the, the coloring version. Um, in the book, you have the opportunity to do a coloring version. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a compilation of all of those together and feature it on my YouTube channel and on my social media pages as well. Um, because like I said, art is a form of therapy yes. and I wanted to use this opportunity to, to showcase people who have healed from even just utilizing the book cover um, as or the coloring version of the book cover as a opportunity for them to heal. So again, thank you very much, Suzanne. You're very welcome. And I can tell you as an author myself, it's always good to offer a little freebie and worksheets and coloring is that kind of add-on service that you get with your phenomenal book that is full of incredible content to help people heal. Again, thank you, Dr. Radley. Remember, you can heal one bite, one thought, one prayer, one intention at a time. Eden's Living TV, all things naturopathic. Thank you, Dr. Radley. You're welcome here anytime. Thank you, Suzanne. Y'all have a blessed night. Thanks for tuning in. If you like programs like this, think about making a cash donation or inbox me. We'll take checks. But I really want to get the platform out there to teach people you can heal. There are naturopathic approaches. You don't have to just drug, cut, radiate, and burn it. All right, guys. Y'all have a great night.